All right. It's now 105, so I think we'll make a start. Welcome everyone to the third week of our workshop series. Just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Um, if you are going to be talking, that's fine. You can unmute yourself then, but otherwise, please keep yourself on mute so that you don't disrupt the call. Uh, and yeah, same with using headphones. If you're going to be talking, please use headphones so that we don't hear a um, sound from your computer and we don't get an echo so, and notification sound and so on. All right. Um, yeah, I think we'll just make a start then. So first things first, I want to talk a bit about what we talked about last week. So last week we were looking at how to train a model and what that means um, as far as data sets are concerned. So um, we were looking at this malaria data set as a case study. So we had cells, they'll split up between parasitized and uninfected cells. And then we fed that through a model, which then learned to distinguish the difference between them, right? But what this pipeline ended up looking like is something a bit more like this, right? The model itself doesn't actually understand what images are. First, you need to translate it into something that it can understand, a matrix full of numbers. Then we pass it through the model, which in turn makes some kind of prediction. We then need to interpret this, right? Because the model only works with numbers. Um, this it output itself isn't particularly human intelligible. So we then need to have a look at that and decipher what it actually means, right? So if each of these numbers represents you know, a percentage chance of how much like this class um, the image is, yeah? Um, if you know, the second one is higher, then we can say it's probably this class. If the first one's higher, then maybe it's the other one, right? Um, but needing to do that as a human is very annoying. Um, and that's not something that your users are going to need to do. So that's essentially what we're going to be looking at today. How do we take this process and make it more user-friendly? How do we bundle it inside of an application? So when we take things outside of the notebook, when we take this model that we've trained and we put it into production, rather than going through all of these steps, it makes more sense to black box it away, right? This means that you can bundle away your model into something that any developer can use, right? They don't need to understand the machine learning behind it because it's just an input and an output. What is the image? And what is the class that this image actually belongs to? So what does this black box need? Firstly, we need the transformations, all right? The transformations are things like forcing the image to be of a specific size. Um, the model is expecting a certain dimension of input. So we need to resize the images so that, they will, so that they're not gonna break the model as we pass it through. We also need to convert it into a, a data type that the model is actually going to understand. In PyTorch, this is called a tensor. Um, but if you're not familiar with that word, basically it's just a matrix, it's a grid of numbers, okay? It's a way to organize the information. We need to tell the model what the names of the classes are. So in our case, we have parasitized cells and we have uninfected cells. Unless we provide the names of these classes, the model doesn't actually know. It just knows class zero and class one. It would also be useful to provide some level of confidence. What this means is, what do we do if the model actually isn't sure, right? We could just return the class where it predicts the highest, but maybe that's not the most helpful way, right? Um, consider the case where it outputs, you know, 10% confidence in both classes, or maybe 10% in one and 11% in the other, right? It's not, it's not confident in either of the predictions. But if we still confidently return, you know, class two, or in this case, uninfected, um, maybe that's not particularly useful, all right? This is, in the case of say, you know, a, a detector between cats and dogs, maybe the consequences is pretty narrow. But if the consequence is 
deciding whether or not a cell is contaminated with, well, infected with malaria. Um, you know, maybe, maybe this matters a little bit more. Maybe we wanted to say that, we wanted to err on the side of saying that maybe you should check this out, right? Or maybe you want to say that if the model is unsure, then we just say that it's not sure. And so we need to specify what that confidence level is. So that's what this idea is, all right? And we can bake this into how we interpret the model. We also need to tell the model how to, um, like, which device to run on. Some devices have CPUs. Some devices also have GPUs. GPUs are more efficient, but they also cost more money, right? And not every device that the application is going to run on may have a GPU available. So we need to tell the class what to do. And of course, we need to provide it with the model itself, the weights that we've trained. Before I move on, are there any questions about this? OK. So what we'll be looking at in the demonstration this week is a class that does exactly this, a black box, an evaluator. Um, so uh, we'll be going through each of these functions, and we'll be talking about what it does. Um, and then you'll be getting a chance to play with this in the, in the breakout rooms later. So this first function, the init function, um, this is something that Python does. The init function is a magic method, right? Magic methods are what we call these things with the double underscore. They're also called dunder methods. Um, but essentially magic methods are what defines how a class behaves under different ways that classes can commonly be used. For example, the dunder call method is run whenever you call a class like a function. You could use the dunder add method to define what a class does when you plus it to a number. You the init method is run at the beginning whenever you initialize the class. So the first time that you make it, right? So this init method is going to take our model, our transforms, which device we're using, and the confidence level. Um, this confidence is stated at 1.5. You may find this a little bit confusing because you know, we've been talking about percentage chances so far. Um, in the version that you'll actually be playing with, I've adjusted this. Um, so it will actually take a percentage. Uh, but the reason why this doesn't is because the evaluation function that we use has sigmoid built in. So 1.5 will end up being round about 80%-ish. But you won't have to worry about that when you actually play with the class later. I just forgot to adjust, adjust, um, adjust the slides. This syntax here is essentially where we are storing this information inside. If we don't store it here, the information that was passed through will be lost. Now, here we have our call method. The call method defines what we do as a function. Uh, essentially, what our, we want our evaluator to do is to you know, when we, when we run it with some input, we want it to return the prediction. And what this does is first we pass it through the model and then we evaluate it. Yeah, either we evaluate it as a single input or you evaluate it as a list. Is there any questions about this before we move on? We're going to be talking about these functions later. Okay, so you'll notice that these functions are very similar. Here, we, you know, if it says evaluate one, um, we take it, we run it through the transforms, as we talked about. This is making sure the image is the correct size, putting it into a format that PyTorch can understand. We then unsqueeze it. What that means is adding an extra dimension. This is because PyTorch is expecting um, a stack of images, right? So you can pass in more than one at once. But by unsqueezing it, we add an extra dimension, so it becomes a list of one image. In the list case, we apply the transforms to each of the elements in that list, and then we stack it together, right? So if you had two lists, you'll have a list 
of two images. All right. We call these groups batches. And then we pass it through the model. We return it back to its original dimensions and we return the output. Or we pass through the model, we put it on the correct device, just as before, and then we return a list of outputs. Okay. So as you can see, these two functions are basically doing the same thing. Only one operates on a series of inputs and one operates on just one. By having this behavior where we you know, change it based on which class, wait, where we change it based on which class we have, right? If it's a list, we operate as a list, otherwise we do this. Then we can use the same class for both data types. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Um, I do have one question. Yes. Which is, uh, why are you using a single underscore in front of these uh, methods? Right, yes. Um, so this is a convention. Essentially, if you start a method inside a class with a single underscore, then you're, you're marking this as an internal method. It's not intended to be called outside of the class. Um, okay. So it's just a programming style. There's nothing about Python which requires you to do it this way. But it would be the equivalent of, I think, in Java, where you have public and private methods, right? So the, the ones with underscore are private methods. They're, not, they're only intended to be used internally. Cool. This is the interpret function. Um, basically, we've said, if it's underneath the confidence level, I've accidentally hard coded it in 1.5, the version that you have will be correct. Um, if it is underneath the um, confidence, then we return not sure. Otherwise, we will return the name of that class. We have a question in the, stat, uh, in the chat. Is it only for notation purposes, or does Python actually recognize it? Python will not recognize it. It's just a convention that I use. Um, I think it's a pretty common convention. Um, but you know, Python does not care what you call your, your internal methods or external methods. Um, if you wanted to run, you know, class dot underscore interpret, you could actually call that function. You shouldn't, <laughs> because it's intended to only be internal, right? Um, but you can. And here we have an example of how we can actually call this class. So here, we're just creating a CNR. This is ResNet 18. This is the same model as we used last week. Um, you will note that we're actually using a different function here. Before it was create CNN learner. That's because a learner object includes a model and a data set, as well as you know, things like learning rates and transforms. Um, that way you can just call it and it will run the training. We're not interested in all that. Here we only want the model. In fact, if you do delve into the fast AI code, create CNN learner calls CNN model. Um, so we're just skipping a step and, and just taking it that way. But really there's, there's nothing new here. What we're then doing is loading in the weights. Um, so we're just taking the weights that we've used for training before. We then stored it in some file. We're now reading it from that file and then updating the weights from this ResNet 18 so that it, it um, you know, has the state and can take advantage of all the training that we've already done. And that's what this load state dict does. Okay. This file is called the state dictionary, or at least it loads back as a state dictionary. We then have these transforms that we mentioned earlier. And then we just pass that in into the evaluator. Um, if you're observing, you'll notice that I only have two inputs here, even though previously when we defined our class, we had you know, a bunch more. That's because I'm using defaulting. Uh, this is just a Python thing that just lets you make functions a little bit neater. Essentially, um, this equals something syntax means that if I don't specify anything else, use that as the input. All right. So I'm saying default to using the CPU and default to using 
or about 80% confidence. Okay. Are there any questions about that before we jump into the breakout rooms? All right, okay. I'm gonna organize for you to go into some breakout rooms. There's a bit.ly link on the, uh, what do you call it, slide? Yes, a slide. There's a bit.ly link on the slide. This is where the public version of the notebook is. Please make a copy before you run it, okay? Uh, do not run the public copy. I have a backup just in case someone does, but please do not do that or we'll all be very sad. Um, okay. But aside from that, I'm going to put you all in breakout rooms now. Please ask your demonstrators if you have any questions about that. What you're going to be looking at is using this evaluator and having uh, a bit of a play to see this, what, how you know, evaluating with more um, images or less images affects the evaluation time. Later on in the demonstration, sorry, in the workshop, Yes. Later on in the workshop, we're going to be talking about uh, how this will affect how you design your application. So we have CPU and we have CPU loop. All right. What you all should have found is that when you run it as a loop, it takes a lot longer. Um, this may have not been explained the best in the notebook itself. Um, the idea was for you to just have a look at the code and try and work out what the difference was. But essentially, um, the reason why the loop takes longer is the way that it looks in the code. Actually, I might just show you the code. Uh, you guys can still see this, right? I didn't bind it to a specific. Um... Yep, we can still see it. OK, excellent. All right. So if you look at inefficient eval, which is our, our inefficient loop, right? Um, instead of running a list of length i plus 1, we are running this for loop i times. Yeah. So the difference is um, instead of using a list and then processing them all at once, we're processing one image at a time, many times, right? So you have to go through the whole process of unsqueezing and so on every time. And so that's why it's less efficient. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, so PyTorch is designed to work with batches, all right? And so when we lean into that and we take advantage of this, it takes less time than if we were to just evaluate one image at a time. So the advantage of using um, a, a batch is that we can process more images at once which means that we spend less time evaluating. But in applications, right, using a batch means that now you need a batch to evaluate, right? You can't just evaluate as soon as the image comes in. Um, this is, I guess, if you imagine an application which is designed to up, for you to upload you know, a folder of images at a time, maybe this is appropriate. But if your application is only running the odd image every now and then, if you wait for an entire buffer to fill, you could be waiting a while. So the trade-offs. If you look at this graph, you can see that the GPU is also a lot more efficient than the CPU. Um, this is because GPUs are specifically designed for you know, op op doing matrix operations very fast. CPUs aren't so much. GPUs are initially designed for, for you know, graphics processing units. They're designed for, for um, rendering graphics at high, high frame rates for games mostly. Um, but they're also very useful for matrix operations, so we can take advantage of them here. Uh, the big advantage here is obviously the faster evaluation time, but your user now needs access to a GPU, right? Which they may not. Or if you're running on the server, this means that your server now needs GPU, which costs money, okay? In a lot of cases, if you're only running a small model, CPU is fine. You don't actually need the GPU. But in, in the cases of high throughput, maybe you would need a GPU.
All right. So moving on with the rest of the slides. So how, I guess the most basic case of running a model would be to have it direct on the application. Okay, so what this looks like is maybe you have a phone app. I guess you can't see it if I hold it away from my face, but so if you have a phone, right? And it's running some application, if it needs to run a machine learning model, then if you have it direct, one, your phone does not have a GPU, so you can't take advantage of that. Um, but also if you just run things direct, the time taken is CPU loop time, right? And as we talked before, that's the most inefficient. But if your application is literally take a picture of something and then determine whether or not it is class one or class two, CPU might be fine. One example of this might be if you have, you know, you've trained it on skin cancer samples, right? You take a picture of your mole and then the app tells you whether or not it's worth checking out a doctor, okay? You don't need it to be the most efficient thing in the world. It just needs to work. And so CPU is probably fine. Um, I know other examples of CPU based ones, like there are keyboards, for example, which, which use neural networks to improve your, your spell check. Um, yeah, examples like that. This is also a pretty simple design, which makes it very easy. And it also lets you tailor the model to the user. Um, if you need a different model for every user base, having the model somewhere which isn't on the device rapidly becomes very unfeasible, right? If you say, if you have a million users, right? Are you going to train a million models at a time? It's going to take a lot of compute. It's impractical. But if you have it on device, then maybe you can just train it using the device's idle time or something. If it's a relatively light model, maybe it won't take so long. Um, the disadvantages here is that it isn't going to be able to use GPU, but as we discussed before, it won't be needed. The other disadvantage is the application and the model have to now share resources. This puts constraints on how big your model can be, right? Bigger models have more parameters. They're able to learn more complex features. So if properly trained, that is, because bigger models are also harder to train, um, this now puts a constraint on how accurate we can make our models. There are models which are specifically designed to run on lightweight and hardware, like phones, for example, mobile net. Um, but this is something that where it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, another example of how you might want to tailor the model to a user, um, a more health application might be you know, monitoring someone's sleep, for example. Um, you know, over time, you can pass the, the sleep data through the network, maybe it can get better at learning you know, when you're being restless and when you're not. Are there any questions about this before we move on? Okay. Here's the next case, slightly more complicated model, right? Here, we have a buffer. So we take things, we load the, the inputs into the buffer and then we pass it through as a big list. This lets us use CPU batch time rather than CPU loop time. As we talked about before, this is a little bit more efficient, but we now have the added complexity of the buffer. What this gets us is a, save, a, a saving in computation overall, but as we discussed before, now you need to wait, right? You need to wait for this buffer to fill up. But maybe this makes sense if you're working with, I don't know, for example, stream data, right? Maybe you have a video and you want to, to run the frames through the model, right? Now that you have a lot of images, now all of a sudden efficiency becomes a lot more important. And so batching up the data into chunks as the frames come in, perhaps makes more sense than just running things directly. Any questions about this before we move on? Okay. Here's the next case, which is another abstract in your way. Again, all right, maybe we can run things on a server, right? What this looks like is 
our application has a Nginx connection and it forwards the input over to the server, right? The server now receives stuff from many users. It then batches that together and evaluates it. Now, because it's on the server, if we wanted to, we can use a GPU. Yay! But it also might not be necessary, as we talked about before, right? If we're only talking about small images here and there, if your web app isn't very popular, maybe you don't need GPU because GPU costs money. The other thing to keep in mind is, depending on how big your model is, how long it takes to evaluate, maybe the difference between CPU and GPU doesn't matter. Because maybe the big limiting factor is internet speed. So the savings that you get from CPU to GPU may not even be worth the money. So advantages that we can see here. Now the application no longer has to share. It can use all of the resources. The application no longer needs the same language as the model, right? Um, we don't, if we're developing in Python and a web app is working in JavaScript, it doesn't matter anymore. We can have the server running in an entirely different language. And we can also take advantage of larger models here, right? Now we can just size our server appropriately so it can handle whatever we need. Disadvantage here, we can't tailor anymore like we were talking about before. As you increase the number of users, it becomes very infeasible as things get faster. Um, you now need to wait for your internet connection, which means one, if your application doesn't have internet, then you know you don't have you can't run your model. Um, but you also need to wait for the image to upload and you need to wait for the request to come back. And if someone has particularly slow internet, maybe it would have been faster to run on the device all along. The other thing is now you have servers to maintain. They need to be updated. They cost money. They can crash. If everything's on the user's device, you don't have to worry about this complexity. That's a bit of a spoiler. That's the next part. My bad. Are there any questions before we move on? All right. Load balancing. So load balancing is the next abstraction away, right? Um, rather than contacting a server which is running a model, we contact one central place, which then load balances between multiple servers which run models. What this means is that rather than having one server, which is limited in how much it can process, we can add as many servers as we want on this end, and our app can just scale. This is useful because it means that as we increase the number of users that we have, we have an option on this end where we can just you know, add more servers, pay more money, and the problem solved. Advantage here. We now have redundancy, right? We can update one server at a time, and there doesn't need to be downtime. We also have scalability, but we also have a much more complicated system now to maintain. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of overheads associated with managing multiple servers, which, you know, just running on device doesn't have to worry about. And indeed, if you only had one server, right, there's less things that can go wrong. Are there any questions? I'm either doing a fantastic job of explaining things or you're all very lost. <laughs> and I'm not sure which. Okay, all right. So this comes to the end of my presentation, but what I have built for you guys is a little bit of a demonstration of how this actually works in practice. All right, so I built a web app and a small server which is going to, um, I guess, run a model. Um, so you can see how this evaluator gets, can be put in practice. It's worth noting that if you were to actually put a model in practice, you wouldn't use a class like this, right? 
Um, there are more efficient ways of doing that. There's a library called TorchScript, for example. It uses JIT. Uh, if you don't know what that is, JIT is a way to write in Python, but have it run like C, which is much more efficient. So it'll take less time. But that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, and it was useful to talk about this evaluator example so you could see what was going on under the hood. If there are no other questions, I'm going to bring up this web app. So we have this Flask server, all right? Talking about the actual web dev of this is beyond the scope of what this workshop is about, right? But what you can hopefully see is that in this evaluator.py file, this code should all be familiar to you, all right? This is more or less copy pasted from the workshop. It's using the out of date code, so it still says confidence equals 1.5. I'm sorry, I updated it last night. Couldn't bother fixing everything. But I hope it gets the same message across. Here you have the endpoints. OK. Um, if you don't know what an endpoint is, essentially it's something that you can call. right? So we send the image to the specific URL, and then it will return the response. If you go to this web server and you contact you know, slash malaria, um, in the body of that request, if you pass it an image, it will then run evaluator. And I, I hope you can see, right? This is just the, the, the code in order to get the image out of the web request. The actual evaluation of the model is one line. And that's the advantage of passes like this. Are there any questions about the code before I bring up the actual thing? So this here is a web server. Okay, I've, I've just activated the Flask run. Um, basically, we're going to have this on one side, and we're going to have the actual malaria detector web app on this side. Um, if I actually didn't design it to work at half speed, half screen, so maybe this isn't gonna, maybe it's gonna fail in some spectacular way, but that's okay. Let's watch it fail together. Um, okay, so the code for this is on the GitHub. If you are interested in the actual web dev of the matter, um, have a look, all right? I'm not gonna guarantee this necessarily done with the best practices because I threw this together rather quickly because it was just for demonstration. Um, but it should give you an idea of essentially how this works. So if we download this, all right, on the inside we have the images that you were working with in the tutorial. Um, the web app doesn't like it when it's still zipped. So if you just let me unzip that to work with. I'll just you know, drag this onto my desktop. Excellent. Okay. We can now drag images and it will evaluate. Ah, uh, that's, that's a little bit disgusting. Yeah, let me just fix that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, and so you can just put in one image at a time and it works. Are there any questions about how this works? Can everyone see how using the class um, helped to extract everything away just to make things easier? Does anyone want me to go through the front end? Hey Mitchell, do you, yes. have, do you have an example of an image that might come up? Um, as like unsure, like within the confidence level? Uh, let me find an image of a dog. <laughs> right, that'll probably work. Uh, if I see link as, nope, that's a HTML image. Um, either this is going to confidently say that it's malaria or something, um, or it'll, oh, I don't, I don't want that file type, I want PNG. <laughs> Um, uh, save the fish. Okay, let's just go with this. 
This is gonna work. Um, Okay, puppy has malaria. Um, <laughs> that wasn't what I was hoping that was going to happen. <laughs> uh, so the reason why this happens is because we only ever shared images of cells which have malaria and cells which don't. Um, what that means is that it has no concept of anything outside the skin cells, right? So if you give it something completely different, it may find things in that cell which is a little bit like, you know, a malaria cell or something which isn't a malaria cell. Um, an example of something which is not sure, I think, I think some of these are actually not sure if I go through them one by one. Um, okay, perhaps not. All right, well, an example of something which is unsure would be if you didn't train your network particularly well, right, if it was only 80% accurate, right, um, there would be some edge cases where maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's uninfected, but there's a mole on it, which looks weirdly like the, uh, the purple dots that malaria looks like, right? Then it might be not sure. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question <laughs> in a possibly unsatisfying way. Um, no, Yvonne, there wouldn't be very many situations where the dog would find its way into the malaria detector, unless someone like me right now is intentionally trying to break it. Um, but maybe that's kind of the point, right? Maybe if you make this a more robust AI, maybe you need to create a third category for things which aren't cells, right? That way, rather than confidently shouting out malaria, it'll say, you know, this, this image is wrong. Take a, a better image of your skin. Awesome, thanks Mitchell. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move on to the second part of the workshop. So we've got Darren, um, who is the president of MIMI. He's gonna be doing a little presentation on us um, on stuff around human-centered design and things like that. So Darren, when you're ready, I'll pass on to you. So, um, okay, so today I've been asked to maybe give a bit of presentation about human-centered design and sort of AI or, or tech in general. Um, so the reason why I think this was more put in is to understand how in practice things like AI or machine learning or any sort of automation slash technology can find its way to a potential sort of user or human and how usually that process sort of happens. Um, and so the whole purpose of having a human design approach is to be able to embed your user or a human in the center of everything that you do so that whatever you build, people actually use. And it's all about trying to put people first at, every, at the center of your design, your reward functions and all the technical stuff that bleeds into your model or whatever you're trying to do. Um, just for a bit of background, for those who don't know me, I am Darren. So I'm a six year biomed and materials engineering student. There's a bunch of hats that I wear, but the stuff that here isn't really, in, the, the stuff here isn't really as important as I think the skill set, the tool set that I just wanted to touch on today, which is basically the service design slash HCD stuff that I've worked on before. Um, and so today's agenda will be mainly about understanding human centered design, so giving you folks a primer. Um, how we sort of think about AI and how do we evaluate whether a situation really called for AI in the first place. Um, in deciding, let's say, a task where we're looking at a human sort of task, how do, what sort of thinking do we have to understand whether this is a task supposed to be um, automated or should AI be designed in a way to augment like a clinician's sort of, sort of, um, ability? And also a bit of um, discussion on reward functions. So, how do we def how do we design our models to to the, to to distinguish between right and wrong, and how do we sort of work with our users to actually understand how that's going to be implemented technically? Um, so, there's there's a bit of a misnomer when we talk about design because design, to most people, they sort of think of it as like a more graphic or visual design. 
Uh, but essentially design is all about trying to build the right thing. And what I really mean by that is building the right thing in terms of identifying who your users are, what is the user need, and whether, in this case, whether um, artificial intelligence or machine learning or any sort of automation really makes sense in this specific context. And it's really important because there's lots of cases, actually, especially within medical technology and also within um, just normal technology, where people try to build stuff and no one really wants it because 99% of startups fail, and most of that is due to market failure because essentially it's not really solving a problem that really exists and we're trying to avoid that with human set design the second part of um, design is trying to build things the right way and what i really mean by that is taking a look at in our instance for the ai stuff what are the biases baked into our reward function so if i come in with a mental model of the world and i build my reward function based on my own biases how, do, how does that reflect in the end result and how does that affect the world? Um, and also because lots of um, machine learning sort of um, algorithms depend on lots and lots of training data, what is the bias in our data sets and is that representative? An example I can give within healthcare is the notion of heart attacks. So um, with women's health, there's a big debate surrounding the symptoms that women tend to have with heart attacks that define as atypical. And the reason behind that is because for the longest time, we've only studied heart attack in white males. And so anything that comes out of that's different from a white male's perception of what a heart attack is, is defined as atypical. And so the whole paradigm in terms of how we look at heart attacks have started to shift in the past few years. And if we were to implement that within our machine learning sort of algorithms, we would think that like all women or anything that exhibits anything that's outside of what we tend to expect out of our bias would be wrong in terms of our sort of reward function. And also in, in trying to build things right, we want to know whether, uh, how exactly are we actually helping the user? So if it's a really sort of repetitive task, are we sort of automating something? Or are we trying to just give them the tools to be able to be better at their job? And so with healthcare, especially with like the high stakes, it might be less um, incentive to automate stuff, but there might be more incentive to give the clinicians the tools they need to be just better at their jobs in general. Um, and so when, we, when I think of human centered design, so this is something called the double diamond framework. So stop me if I'm going too quickly or feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, but um, the whole notion of human design, there's lots of frameworks about this. There's the you know design thinking, et cetera. The ones that I've used a lot in my work has been the double diamond framework. And so the first diamond is essentially what I mentioned, designing the right thing. So essentially trying to discover your problem, understand who the problem touches and what about the problem they, that they hate, what problem that's annoying about it. The second diamond, which is the solutions, is trying to look at the problem you have and make a technical decision on is AI or machine learning or whatever tech stack that I'm trying to put in here, is that actually relevant? And what architecture do I have to need, do I have to do to be able to fulfill the user need? It also goes into, given that I know that this user has a problem, what kind of data do I need? So how do I try to go from user need to data need in terms of trying to like label my data points, et cetera. And how do I translate that to actual functionality or something to a front end to the web app or interface that a human can interact with. Um, so this might suggest this is a linear process. It isn't, it's a link. It's a really um, circular process. This is constant iteration, but this is just a uh, sort of really simple heuristic or mental models that people, or well, I sort of, sort of use. And I'll tell you about like results of using this sort of stuff later. Um, so I thought I'd just run you through a bit of a case study of uh, my work recently with this sort of stuff. So just a bit of background. I haven't done specifically AI sort of implementation before. I've done what's the equivalent of a Wizard of Oz, Oz test that would be eventually implemented into AI because I left the project after. Um, but this is Mama Box. So Mama Box was a project I worked on a few years ago and was based around trying to, uh, trying to build an autonomous Skinner's box. 
So if you don't know what Skinner's box is, is a, it's a box where um, you put a rat and you give it positive or negative reinforcement and you teach them the rules of the game. And my whole project, so I designed the first, first two versions of this, basically just built the entire the, the technical architecture. It was all surrounding trying to do this, to build this Skinner box in a way that can completely remove human intervention, it was be completely autonomous. Um, and so what happens that when I first came in the project, I sort of looked at my framework and the whole, my whole first few months was trying to understand the lay of the land, trying to understand who I was working with and what problems they sort of face in trying to build out experiments in the first place. So I got found myself in sort of a team of neuroscientists and anatomists back up in um, army. And so what we essentially did is just sat down to start talking to people. So the first thing that we tend to do when we try to roll out technology is that we don't go straight to a solution. We just want to really understand, get into the mind of the people that will do, eventually use the technology that we're working with. Um, and so when we sort of do this sort of uh, user interview or sort of problem mapping scoping stuff, um, we want to remove as much bias as possible out of our own questions. So we have to remove as much of our mental models out of the question. So these might, these questions, these sort of prompts might seem a bit, you know, like obvious, but the reason why we say, tell me about the last time you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or how did that make you feel? Or uh, what's the most time consuming part of, it, of, of, the, of the problem that you're trying to face is that our whole motivation is trying to understand behavior because behavior drives um, actions and also drives why people would want to use a piece of technology in the first place. And also I combine that with something called contextual inquiry. So contextual inquiry is that when you go into someone's context and you just observe them doing the problem or the task at hand. So I spent, I think two to three months just talking to neuroscientists and just being a fly in the wall of them conducting baby experiments because what people say they do never really correlates as well to what they actually do. So if you told me that, um, like you go to the gym every, I'd say two times a week. There's a difference between me asking you that and, uh, and me asking you when was the last time you went to the gym? Because for some people, the last time they went to the gym was four weeks ago. And then when you catch them on that, they just say, oh, uh, oh that, uh, I don't know. That's just like, you know, this behavior. So often enough, you need to look at both what people think that people want to think, want to think that they do and what they actually do because the, the incongruency between that, those two expectations is where you can look, look at your technology and see, okay, how do I bring those two closer together? Um, any questions so far? No? All right. So throughout the entire process, uh, we map, I mapped out the entire sort of workflow of what a researcher would do in their daily day and what the thought process was like in trying to design a experiment for like a monkey or a marmoset. And really the whole process was trying to map out in a way that was obvious to me where the bottlenecks in the process were and where technology could fit. So let's say if, for example, in the malaria, malaria sort of context, um, you would try to understand in what sort of em emotional situation would be someone trying to be using that tool if you were looking at, let's say, a layman, when would they be using it? If you were talking to a specialist, what context would, be use, would they be using it as well? Um, what sort of facilities would they have? What sort of um, reading level would they have? What sort of understanding of the technology would they have? Because those are really important in terms of like uh, trying to get people used stuff in the first place. Um, and so what I did was once I automated, some, once I mapped it all out, I built a really sort of crude version of what I eventually wanted to build. So essentially I did something called a Wizard of Oz test. So a Wizard of Oz test is when you give a example of what you want to build and you let people interact with it and you tell them it's autonomous, but in reality, you're in the background just doing stuff manually. Um, so, and so what, originally happened with this was that I would say, okay, um, 
I would I would give my um my um my researcher friends like a example in the face of how things would work, like essentially the wireframe, right? And we'll try to walk them through the entire process and try to identify places where they would be really excited about a feature and where they would be like a bit sort of iffy about a feature and keep that note. Because the whole reason is trying to stop myself from committing too much effort into trying to build something that probably no one wants. Um, and so all the, from all those insights, all, all sort of those uh, interviews, I produce sort of insights for myself. So insights are just things that you know that are fact but they're all based on behaviors that you've observed or behaviors that uh, you know for sure that this has happened before and will crop up again and again. And from those insights, I've clustered those into themes. So themes about how my tech stack, my um, technology should be able to function or how the technology should sort of feel in the first place. And when those themes are really clear, then I looked at what sort of, um, sort of um, holes within the workflow I can sort of innovate and put in a technology, put in sort of a model be it to be able to streamline things even further. And from then on, you have a clear user need. So within my project, I end up doing this sort of design philosophy thing where I sort of knew how, how, this, how this sort of perspective system should feel to the user, how the perspective system would actually interact with the animal itself because the animal itself um, is very scared of humans. So, the thing about armor sets is that like, if they don't know you, they jump onto the cage and pee on you. And you actually have to throw your, all your clothing because like the stench just like sticks on you for like months. And so being able to remove the human invention was that was really, really important, which is why eventually we decided to make this entirely autonomous. Um, and so that, so from that on, we sort of arrived at this, this phase in the project. So that's here. Oh, actually. Yeah, in the project. So at the end of this time, we knew we sort of narrowed down ourselves into this final point where, all right, I think we, we that's a real problem that we're trying to solve here. And next next step is just trying to ideate and trying to understand whether you know our sort of solutions actually make sense in this context. So really, so for those who were wondering, our problem that we were trying to solve is that when when you conduct behavior experiments with animals, a problem is um, small animals think humans are predators. And that means you, that means a lot of our knowledge of how behavior in animals and subsequently like drugs that, you know, work on the psychological, like um, in terms of uh, psychology or psychiatry, they're all conducted on animals who are already stressed in the first place. So when I talked about bias in data, that bias in data has been present for a long, long while. So, and we haven't had really good naturalistic models of animal behavior in since forever. And so the whole goal of this whole project was to just remove human invention immediately, because I think, because that was the whole sort of purpose of trying to get as natural a representation of animal behavior so that we can look at that and look at like human schizophrenia and understand in the real world how applicable is our sort of data, types of behavior. Um, and so step one of trying to like actually putting, put in like a AI model is essentially decide if it's of value at all. Um, and this is when you start trying to understand how are we trying to build things in the right way? And so AI is pretty good at the moment, as far as I know, um, in recognition of an entire class of entities. So if you do something like text mining or image classification, they're really, really good at that. Um, they're, they're really good at making predictions or recommendations. So if you use Netflix, most of your recommendations are powered by AI. And they're really good at dynamic and personalized content. So based on someone's sort of pattern behavior, pattern behavior beforehand, we can make predictions and recommendations on what they potentially would be suited to or would potentially like. The last one that AI is pretty good at is the detection of low occurrence events over time. So um, if you work in finance, AI is used a lot in fraud detection because those are just anomalies that crop up in the data and AI is used to detect that on a large scale. And um, another example in healthcare is someone I know who works at Monash who's some, working on something called fungal AI. And it's an entire sort of disease surveillance system that mines the um, text check transcripts of radiology reports to understand 
uh, where sort of um, fungal infections are cropping up in the health system. And so in our context, I was looking at moments of learning. So we would give a marmoset a whole battery of tests of increasing difficulty. And I wanted to capture where exactly the light bulb switches on in the animal's head and they get the, get the task. So my whole model was trying to look at where exactly do we see some spikes in people getting it, getting things right? Because that would be places where we knew, all right, that's the average learning time of our mama set. Then we can compare that to someone who has an impaired sort of um, brain ablation and see, all right, in our schizophrenia model, because schizophrenia is correlated with learning, difficult, learning difficulties, how badly impaired is the learning sort of performance of someone who might have some sort of schizophrenia? Um, and also trying to decide what AI is probably not good at is essentially trying to maintain predictability because with AI, we, we deal with probabilities and probability and confidence intervals a lot. Um, often in times, especially with high stakes sort of, uh, high stakes sort of tasks, there's a lack of transparency in terms of how we arrive to the end result, especially in terms of like black box type stuff. It's also not as good as automating high value tasks, but that's more of a human problem because it's very hard to be able to convince a human to be able to give off, give off control of a high value task to a computer, even though it might on paper seem best way to do things. And it also doesn't really work well in high speed, low cost situations when you need to get to market really quickly, because often enough, the best, the quickest way to, to get stuff in front of user in a startup situation is not to build in time model, but to just have an army of, you know, minimum, minimum hour wage workers just working stuff on stuff manually, which is a gi gigantic visit of our test. And so I guess when, when we sort of thought about trying to think about whether this was a good approach to our project, we essentially asked ourselves, instead of asking whether AI could do something, it was more about how might we solve this problem and can AI solve this problem in a really unique way that only it can? Because um, we didn't want to approach the problem with AI as a hammer and see everything as a nail, because that can be a bit dangerous. So the poor question to ask is, can we use AI to do XXX? Because that presupposes a solution. And when we presuppose a solution, we close ourselves off of other solutions that might work better. And so AI is just part, is AI or machine learning or all those algorithms are just part of a gigantic other toolbox that we sort of use. Um, the second bit to our project was trying to look at whether there was a trade-off between automation and augmentation. So what I mean by that is um, some tasks in general, people love to handle. So they want to give this off to AI because they're boring, they're repetitive, they're awkward and dan or dangerous. Um, another thing is that sometimes there are situations where people either lack the knowledge or ability to perform set tasks. And that's when we design our, our technology to be geared more towards automation. And so with Mama Box, that's the decision that, decision that we took because 95% um, of it is just automated. And the, and the sort of machine learning part comes into the progression of our monkeys through various stages of learning. And I was trying to assess and compare between different animals, how well they perform. Um, and so the, the augmentation part of it was more for our sort of researchers trying to understand um, or be able to get data that they've never had before. So it's, we, because this was less of a software project, but more of a mecha mechatronics project, we could look at um, reaction time, we could look at um, objective objective measures of attention, objective measures of learning, and um, sort of database object um, uh, database measures of like um, of like uh, distraction, and seeing whether people were showing symptoms of ADD or something like that. The second part of that is once you decide between automation versus augmentation, it's trying to design your reward function, and so when you so your reward function basically means what does your model determine what is right, how does it determine what is right and what is wrong in terms of what your user thinks. And 
are the consequences for ha having the right answer and the wrong answer equal? So if I get this wrong, what are the consequences? And what if the consequence and if I get this right, how right do I have to be? Because we're all this is all confidence intervals, and that's how we sort of tune our confidence interval so that it hits a range where a user is satisfied that the task is now complete. And so when we look at that, we sort of look at the, our instances of false positives and negatives. So for example, um, a problem that we found in our project was we were getting false positives from, from um, our animals trying to lick the, the screen. And when they were done licking, the, the saliva was triggering the screen multiple times and was coming out as false positives. And what was happening is that our model thought they were just being really, really good at the task and progressing them to different sort of levels too quickly. And the consequences of that is that the entire data set has been thrown away because the whole data set has been or basically con contaminated. And so that, that means we have to go back and try to understand what are the really costs in terms of research databases, whether we fucked up in terms of this is a false negative, false positive, because that means we have to go back and actually redesign our whole ar architecture to account for the saliva thing. The second bit of this is trying to optimize for precision or, re precision or, or recall. So precision is when we try to, we try to modify, uh, build models that only bias towards, um, what do you call it? That try to eliminate as many false positives as possible. And recall means that we're trying to optimize for trying to classify all the true positives in our data set as possible. So, but that comes at the risk of capturing some false positives. Um, this isn't really this isn't really sort of confined to AI and machine learning. So if you do work in sort of diagnostics, especially with the COVID diagnostics, this is a huge, huge question to ask because um, the cost of you know having giving someone a wrong sort of test and being being pushing them into lockdown for like self-imposed lockdown for like two weeks is pretty big. And so being so being able to understand this and being knowing this upfront is really important. And so how also that coalesce is that we sat down with my supervisor and the whole team, the neuroscientists that I was working with and basically asked them, what does complete task look like? Um, and, and what did, uh, what did they feel about catching all the positives or minimizing false positives? When do they think a task is complete and what the, what does the model have to do? For you to be satisfied with the result and once we sort of got an answer to that we look we looked at our reward function and started iterating so we wanted to see whether there were any sort of negative impacts so we looked at the impact metrics of our model uh, we conducted what if scenarios so that's a little tool that i posted so you go into that you you upload your sort of i think your algorithm It'll, it'll spit out a bunch of what if scenarios just to make, just to sanity check what your model is actually doing. And also look at your data. Have we encoded bias with our data and, and do the, do our reward functions actually reflect that bias as well? So if you look at this little sort of screen here, there's a bunch of borderline sort of um, touches. So these are all touches on the screen by monkeys. And all the stuff on the borders are almost sort of on the borderline of being wrong. And in some aspects or some sort of use cases, this is fine because all we want to know is being to, all we want to do is to teach our monkeys the concept of a touch screen. Because you want to teach them the concept of this is a touch screen and if you, if you touch it, you get a reward. So I don't really care about how accurate you are. I just want you to touch it. That becomes a bit different as we move through the different steps as, and as user needs change. And because the user needs change, your model has to change with it. And so really the end result of what happened is that we were able to cut down what used to take a year by research down to 54 training hours. Um, so what, so usually the big problem with this, the big sort of, the biggest sort of um, time waster for this is that um, you can only do a limited amount of um, tests per day because we, of the stress levels of your animals, because of you just coming in as a predator and just grabbing your grabbing your marmosets and putting them into like a different cage. 
Whereas we designed the entire system to be completely autonomous and be a part of the animal sort of natural environment in the first place. Um, and because of that, and because we designed the, the models in the right way, uh, we, built, we were able to achieve higher ethical standards with our animal testing. We were able to get naturalist, more naturalistic behavior models and higher quality data. And that meant that when we progressed our clinical testing of, uh, of some of our therapies associated with schizophrenia, we were more confident on, on whether our clinical sort of da or preclinical data actually matched up, would be actually applicable to a real world patient setting. Um, and the whole, and so the end result of this entire um, sort of system is now Vision 2 is a, a central sort of server that coordinates te uh, multiple different sort of um, child servers that all form part of a 10 sort of, how do I, how do I phrase this? Essentially there's a master server and there's, a, and there's four to five children of uh, those testing boxes that are all attached to different marmosets. And now we're at the point that we can test five animals at once and be able to cut down what would take, you know, take cumulatively like five years down to maybe a few hundred hours. So I guess what I, the take home message from my talk today is that human centered design or implementing human centered design in when we try to implement anything that's technological at all is really, really, really important to, so that we don't fuck up in terms, fuck up ethically and also fuck up commercially. And so that we build for a real problem that exists because really the, the, the sweet spot that we want to hit is this matrix between this high spot between the user impact and the impact of actually machine learning or AI in the first place. And so the, the take home message when we, when like you guys go off and maybe work on more AI projects in the future is try to understand things from the user's perspective and build empathy into your entire process. So understanding, what are the mental models of my users when working with technology in general? And what are the expectations of AI? I've worked with clinicians who think AI will solve everything. And I've also worked with clinicians who think that AI is, is like dumb and I would, that would rather rely on expert, expert expertise. But you have to understand where they're coming from and you have to state your models or state your features in a way that bring them along on the ride. Um, you have to look at your data. So where is your data coming from? And am I sourcing it responsibly? And is my data representative of my use case? Um, has the data been labeled correctly? Um, and more importantly, how do I go from an really identified user need? How do I frame that in a way for me to be able to gather data in the right way? So I can design the model in the right way, because if you make it, if you fuck up in the user need space, your modern design is going to be just off in, in an entirely different direction. So that's really important. I think that was basically all I wanted to talk about. So I don't know, we can just open up this general Q and A, but if you have any sort of questions about uh, human centered design or, or automation, et cetera, um, you know, sh shout out, but I think that's all. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Darren. Yeah, we still have a little bit of time before we finish up with the workshop. So does anyone have any questions for Darren or for Mitchell about anything that was discussed in the workshop today? Um, feel free to turn on your mic and ask a question or you can send it through on the chat. Darren, um, I, I know you said you worked with a couple of uh, clinicians on projects. So I was just wondering what sort of, um, if you could give any examples of the stuff you've been working on elsewhere, just briefly. Uh so um, I work at Monash Health. Well, I think Andrew is here as well, but this is less AI focused, but I work at Monash Health on um, pediatric dosing. We're building an app to, to help with pediatric dosing and reducing cognitive load when they're trying to do calculations and stuff. We found this a really big general, I wouldn't say it's a big generation gap, but there is a general, generational gap in terms of seniority within the medical profession, in terms of their attitudes towards technology. So if lots of specialists I talk to, so I spoke to around a few hundred people, hundred specialists and doctors last year when I was doing this project. Um, and lots of specialists have their identity caught up in their expertise. And because of that, they're very unlikely to be able to 
to relinquish control of what would be their domain to a computer. Something like a junior doctor I found, we found was that they would be more willing to try new things out because they probably haven't been exposed to that culture as much. And so lots of our sort of projects I work on, we target junior doctors and maybe um, specialists in training because they're more early adopters of the stuff. Um, but they didn't say that you no, know, like all specialists are like that, but there are a significant portion of people that sort of think that way. So the mental models are really important. Another example is um, with fungal AI. So, I'm not sure whether you see my screen, but so fungal AI was, was um, is a project out of the Alfred and they're looking at the surveillance of fungal infections in the Alfred hospital. Um, and they got really big buy-in from this because the whole project was clinician led. So like, we like to think that, you know, doing AI is lots of about the tech, but 80, 90% of it is politics, trying to get people actually on board and trying to get people to even try in the first place. So I think they've done really good, really well in this, but they did really well with this because they engage everyone relevant from the start and they got buy-in from that in the first place. Yeah, so Gerald's here. Anything else? Any other questions? Anyone else have any questions um, for Darren or for Mitchell for the first part of the workshop as well? Um, cool, I think if no one has any questions for today, we'll finish up a little bit earlier today. Um, so we'd just like to say a big thank you for Mitchell for presenting the first part of the workshop and to Darren for coming in and talking about um, some design principles. Um, if anyone has any further questions, um, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, and yeah, so we're going to be having the workshop for next Saturday. So that's going to be the last workshop of the series. And yeah, thank you so much for coming today. Hopefully you guys all got something out of this um, workshop and these recordings will also be available at the conclusion of the workshops so yeah you guys are all free to go thanks again for coming today and hopefully we'll see you all next week bye everyone